Hello. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jane Shepard. As the head of alumni for Udacity, I'm thrilled to welcome you to another episode of our, web our webinar skill series. Today we welcome Nidhi Gupta. Nidhi is from Hired. She's the Senior VP of Technology and she leads the company's global engineering developer operations and product teams. A skilled engineer herself, Nidhi brings unique insights from the engineering, recruiting, and management perspectives to today's explanation of how to create a technical, webina webina a technical resume excuse me, that will get you noticed. So without further ado, please welcome Nidhi Gupta. Hi, everybody. Really glad to be here today. Uh, I know the task of creating a resume is daunting. I have done that many a times in my career, and I've hated it. Uh, so today, I'm here to share with you some of the tips and tricks, tricks that I've learned both as an engineer as well as as a leader uh, and a hiring manager uh, in this industry. So thank you so much, Jane, for the kind intro. Let's get to it. Um, uh, by way of introduction, uh, Jane, thank you so much for the kind words, uh, but a little bit more about my background. I've been in the tech industry for about 20 plus years. I started off as an engineer. Uh, I gradually uh, made my way into management, and now I've been managing engineering teams uh, for over 15 plus years. Um, as a hiring manager, there are certain things that you look for in a resume. As a person who's transitioned from an um, a, from an individual contributor to a manager, there's uh, there's distinct, distinct stages uh, that you go through in that transition in terms of what you want to highlight versus not. That uh, I'm I'm here to share with you today. Through the course of my career, I've hired over 300 engineers uh, and counting. So I think I've sort of aced the art of, um, of processing resumes uh, at, a, at a relatively fast pace. Uh, to, I currently work at Hired. So a little bit about Hired. Hired is a career marketplace that matches top tech talent, uh, people such as yourselves, with the world's most innovative companies. The way we do this is we leverage machine learning uh, and employ that cutting edge technology and combine that with unbiased career coaching via our talent advocates so that both talent and employers can find the right fit faster. Our mission as a company is to find everyone a job that they love. And the way we achieve that is, um, is in the following manner. A candidate, when they join Hired, they create their profile. In conjunction with creating their profile, they also state how much they want to make. Companies then apply to the candidates on our platform. When they apply to the candidate on our platform, they reach out with the salary information up front. This level of wage transparency is unprecedented in our industry. And through the process of your job search, we also combine, we also provide help to our candidates by via of a personal coach who's in your corner. And that function is referred to as uh, talent advocates. Um, the quote on the right is one of my favorites. It comes from one of our candidates who found a job on Hired as a senior UX designer. Uh, and the quote says, Hired is the absolute best way to find a tech or design job. Having a person dedicated to you is very helpful. My talent advocate helped me through every step of the process, including negotiating offers, deciding which offer was right for me. That's the value Hired provides today. Um, and we're very, very proud uh, to be serving our candidates to fulfill our mission. So what are, why are we here today? Uh, in the agenda today, I'm going to cover what the purpose of your resume is, key sections to include uh, in your resume, who you're optimizing for and what you're optimizing in your resume. And I'll also share some market data and trends that we have seen uh, over the course of our history that you ought to know of before you start your job search. Why this topic? Um, like I said, job search may be a tad bit easier if we all didn't have to work on a resume. But today, our industry revolves around resumes. 
the number of times I hear from candidates or uh, in terms of Nidhi, what should I put on my resume is just incredible. Uh, as a candidate, you also don't know what a hiring manager is looking for when they process your resume. And I think that's very, very important because when you're crafting your resume, you need to understand what your audience is looking for in order to highlight that in your resume. And lastly, what are some of the tools at my disposal? Many of us go through our search blindly. Uh, so what are some of the tools that are available that are out there that I can leverage during my search? So that's the reason why this topic is important. So let's get to it. The purpose of your resume. Uh, let's do a quick poll. Uh, should a resume have my entire work history? Um, yes, no, I'm not exactly sure. I think when I ask this question across all the candidates that I've spoken with, the answer overwhelmingly typically is yes. But guess what? No. It's not supposed to have anything and everything you've done on it. I have 20 plus years of experience. If I were to write uh, and document everything that I have done, it would be a tome. Even when you're early in your career, there's a lot of projects that you work on as part of your curriculum, as part of your passion. If you put everything down on your resume, it'll just make the content too voluminous. It's not supposed to overwhelm the reader. Think of a resume as your advertisement. You want to leverage the resume to give a really positive first impression of you as a candidate to both the recruiter as well as the hiring manager. What you, your, the purpose of your resume is to ensure that the reader gets enticed to talk to you more. And that's the first impression you want to leave them with. It's supposed to be targeted for the role that you're applying for. So today I'm an SVP of technology, but 20 years ago, I was an engineer. I do not target an engineering job and I don't even talk about my, my role as an engineer. It should really be catered towards the role that you're specifically targeted targeting uh, in your search. It should be easy to follow and it should convince the reader that you are qualified for the job that you're asking for. And lastly, it should include an objective statement. So we'll talk about objective statement um, in a second. So key sections, let's start with the objective statement. Um, be intentional, be intentional, not just in your resume, but in your search. Understand and know what is it that you're looking for? What is it that you want to do in your next job? Make those intentions clear via this objective statement. Think of this objective statement as your tagline. So in one brief, pithy sentence, you ought to be able to communicate what you have done, what you're good at, and what you're aspiring for. So let's look at a few examples. Uh, manual lead, te uh, manual test lead, or manual test engineer. What that tagline conveys to me is the person whose resume I'm looking at is a manual test engineer, and they're potentially looking for a lead job. The next one is even better because it actually explicitly states what they're looking for. Backend engineer with five years of experience at Snapchat, seeking new opportunities in AI. So this individual is touting the five years of experience that they have at a company like Snapchat, which is a nice, good, great brand. Uh, and they're seeking new opportunities, not in the broad bucket of a backend engineer, but specifically in a particular domain called AI. Similarly, product designer at Airbnb with strong interest in accessibility. So again, they're leveraging and they're touting the brand that, they, uh, that they're working at. They're talking about who they are today, but what they're aspiring to do in the future. I love the last one here, which is data analyst with one year of Python experience, because lots of, as a data analyst, a lot of companies have lots of different technologies that they are employing. So this is a data analyst who has one year of Python experience. Um, and they've taken a GA data science course, and they're seeking junior data scientist roles. 
when I read this, it convinces me that I can give this data analyst an opportunity to uh, uh, and explore a data scientist role uh, for them. The next section, once you figure out what your tagline uh, would be, is work experience. Work experience is very, very interesting. I've seen all forms of work experience. Uh, they could, they are, they could, they range from half a page long work experience all the way to like one sentence work experience. Um, what you want to convey in your work experience for a hiring manager and a recruiter is what are some of the key initiatives that you worked on and what was their impact? especially as a hiring manager, what the hiring manager cares about is what is the big contribution that you made? Why was it critical to the company? Why was it a mover, a needle mover for the company? You want to highlight the skills that were used in each work experience. So more often than not, um, even in my resume, when I, when I have a blurb, uh, for work experience, I have a little line underneath which says technologies used, which helps the help, help helps the reader, reader understand the technologies that I'm familiar with. Uh, when you even this should be done in conjunction with a skills section, because let's say in the skills section I say I have um, I've learned I'm proficient in the skill of Ruby. If I don't mention that anywhere in my work experience, that doesn't inspire a lot of confidence in the reader as to where you've leveraged that skill. So if I've worked at a company for four years and the technology used there was Ruby, then as a manager, I'm doing the mental computation that you're proficient in that particular skill. <clears throat> Highlighting progression is very, very important. And progression could be in a variety of different ways. It could be via title changes, it could be via scope changes, it could be via impact changes. Uh, no hiring manager wants to look at a resume where for 10 or 15 years, the person has continued to do very, very similar things. Uh, that doesn't show aspiration on behalf of the candidate. It could also be progression from a self-learning standpoint. So I started my career in Ruby. I'm continuing to work in Ruby. I'm really proficient in Ruby, but I've taken a Udacity course in deep learning, right? So you wanna make sure that you highlight how you're growing as an engineer and, and as an individual uh, in throughout your career. Skills and language. Um, we talked a little bit about la languages. You want to highlight your proficiency. So I'm familiar with Ruby, HTML, CSS, and Python. They're really in that order. But if you really want to demarcate, especially important for early stages of your career, you could actually have two separate lines. You could say proficient in Ruby, HTML, CSS, and learning or intermediate skills or early skills in Python. Uh, that in one easy snapshot is an indicator to a hiring manager in terms of what you're really good at. And if I have a job for you, if I'm looking for somebody in PHP and you've done Ruby, I'm like, okay, they know Ruby, they can easily learn PHP. So let me talk to this candidate. So you want to make sure that you convey who, what, what languages you're proficient in. Put your links, put your, not just your personal blog, LinkedIn uh, links, but also your GitHub links so that as a hiring manager, very quickly, I not only look at the contents of your resume, but I can also refer back to your GitHub, GitHub profile and see how you've contributed back to the community in terms of technology and what the quality of your code is. Um, if you have a lot of GitHub followers, all the more reason to put that in your on your profile uh, because you want to sort of use that social capital um, and leverage that social capital. Skills, if you're looking to lead or manage a team, you absolutely wanna talk about some skills. And you don't have to talk about those soft skills as a section under skills. Just highlight those skills by virtue uh, when you talk about your work history. So for example, if you're looking to lead or manage a team, working cross-functionally is very important. So liberally sprinkle the word cross-functional in your work history uh, to make sure that people understand that you work with stakeholders, you work with people outside the organization. You want to be very, very mindful of every word that you're choosing uh, in your resume. 
uh, and highlight uh, subtly uh, and explicitly some of these things uh, across the board. Who are you optimizing for? So first, figure out what your strengths are. Um, and in terms of whether you want to focus more on skills or if you want to over-index on your experience. When you're junior and early in your career, you want to focus on skills because that is what the reader is expecting. The reader is not expecting you to have experience and worked on projects at companies. So you want to highlight the skills that you have gained. If you're just graduating, you want to talk about this, the technologies that you're used to, technologies that you're proficient in, and talk about projects. Talk about projects that you may have done as part of your CS degree or as part of your coursework. We see a lot of developers today, thank goodness, who do not have a college degree, who don't have traditional training. When you don't have a college degree, you need to make the hiring manager understand what skills you have learned. Since the industry is full of hiring managers who have a traditional CS degree, I know if I look at a CS degree candidate, I know that they have gone through a data, a data algorithms um, and, um, uh, or, or an OOP class. But if you don't have a traditional degree, I don't know if you have taken those courses or not, or if you have familiarity with those concepts or not. Highlighting those, without a hiring manager actually asking you about them would be key. So if you've taken a course in data uh, algorithms or if you've taken a course in OOP, highlight that uh, so that you just remove the question right out the gate when somebody's looking at your resume. As you gain more experience, start focusing on the projects. Skills become less important, but you wanna start focusing on projects. Um, if you have experience in really unique niche languages like Scala, absolutely highlight that, even if you're not proficient in those languages. Those skills are so hard to get. More often than not, companies are willing to invest in, their, in good candidates for them to learn. So even if you have an introductory familiarity with Scala or any such languages, highlight those in your career. In terms of progression, if you're looking to grow or pivot, it's very important to, to ensure that your resume is catering to the job that you're looking for. So when I was at a transition stage from an engineer to a manager, I actually had two versions of my resume. I had an IC version and a manager version. And the IC version I used when I applied for an IC role, the manager version I used when I applied for a manager role. If you're looking to transition from engineering to product management, do something similar. You want to take that, I know it's painful to have multiple versions of your resume, to maintain multiple versions of your resume, but, it's a, but a hiring manager and a recruiter is going to spend max five minutes on your resume, max five minutes. You wanna make sure that you, at a glance, give them what they're looking for to pass the first test. Uh, speaking of which, what are the things that a recruiter is looking for and what are the things that a hiring manager is looking for? A recruiter is primarily controlling the gate. They want to see, they are the people who look at 100 resumes and of the 100 resumes, they're going to take 15 resumes to the hiring manager for the next pass. The hiring manager is going to whittle that down from 15 to five. So first, you want to pass the gate. And the gate that the recruiter has is what are the minimum qualifications for a job and does this candidate meet those minimum qualifications? What the hiring manager then focuses on is off the 15, do you have the right type of experience? Are you the candidate that would be a great fit for this team? Are you the candidate who is going to come to the company and grow with the company? So they are the ones who are fo truly focusing on the contents of your resume. So if you think about various sections, the recruiter is looking at your objective statement 
to see if you meet the requirement. The hiring manager is looking at your object objective statement to see if you actually aspire for the role that they have to offer. The recruiter is looking for in the skill section and focusing uh, on the proficiency of those skills. The hiring manager is actually focusing on the body of the work experience and trying to and trying to understand your personality and your competence level. So your this one pager is catering to both a recruiter and a hiring manager. So it's it's incredibly important to be mindful of the contents uh, when you're crafting your resume. Um, so let's jump ahead and think about what is some of the research uh, that you should be doing when you start your search. Um, quick poll. Do any of you do market research when applying for a job? And I can't see that. I think I'll see the poll results after. More often than not, the answer here is no. That usually that used to apply for me as well. Let me ask you a question. When you go to a restaurant, you do research, you look at their resume, then you look at their menu online, you Yelp them. Why wouldn't you do the same before you start your search? We often overlook this very, very critical piece uh, uh, in, our, in our job search. So you absolutely need to be mindful and you need to do your research before you start looking. There are many, many resources at your disposal. One of those resources is the state of salaries report that Hyatt publishes every year. <clears throat> uh, I'll share with you some of the data from our last year's data. Um, so, but first a quick overview of what this report is. Hired caters to tech workers. Who are tech workers on our platform? These are software engineers, product managers, data scientists, and designers such as yourselves. Um, we collect these use, uh, unique insights by collecting data from our entire platform and activity on our entire platform. This is actual true marketplace data uh, gathered off of the hired marketplace, which comprises of over 420,000 interview requests and ten, over 10,000 participating companies. This data is very, very accurate because it's not user-generated content. It's not self-reported salary data. This is true salary data that we have seen companies communicate and offer to candidates on our platform. <clears throat> so, so let's look at some of this data. So in 2017, the average tech worker salary, this is the broad map. You can see as a Bay Area, not surprisingly, leads uh, by offering an uh, average tech worker salaries of 142, <clears throat> 142K. Um, Austin, by contrast, offers 118K. New York offers 129K on an average. So if your first starting point is, oh, shoot, I'm getting ready for a job search. I don't even know how much I should be asking. Look at the state of salaries uh, report and see what the average rates are in these markets. But it's also important to understand what these values mean when you adjust for cost of living. When you do that, the, eight, the 118K in Austin is equivalent to 202K in the Bay Area. But in the Bay Area, candidates are not making 200,000 on average. They're making much less than that. So if you're, if you're conscious and cognizant about how much money you're making and how much you would be spending from a cost of living standpoint, you may want to consider relocating or working in some of these other markets uh, that were, where the jobs are and the pay, um, the pay is far more lucrative than the Bay Area. So, um, so make sure that you do your research from a salary standpoint before you get started. How to stay competitive. Uh, here is how tech salaries change year over year by role. All of them have shown an upward trend in 2017. Not surprising. Uh, we're seeing a tech boom of sorts. Uh, data analytics uh, salaries have gone up since most companies are now focusing on data, so that's not surprising. Product management has been on a rocket ship. Um, the trends, uh, the salary trends in product management have been increasing year over year, all the way from 2015 to 2017. That's not surprising. 
Product management is this unique cusp of software engineering and um, and management skills and, and business skills. So it's not surprising that product management is paying as high as, as it is. Um, and typically, as a product manager, you your progression is that you start off as an engineer and then you eventually make your way into product management. You, so you start off with a really strong, solid base before you uh, transition into a project management role, product management role. Uh, software engineer salaries, design salaries, you can see that there's a there's a significant uptick uh, last year. We will soon be publishing our report for this year, and uh, uh, you will, will continue to see those trends continuing into this year as well. What are some of the most requested tech positions by company? Full stack engineer, full stack engineer, baby. Uh, full stack engineer is very interesting because most companies want to keep hiring full stack engineers because it's so much easier to manage the engineering team if you have full stack engineers uh, on your team. Um, they really split into front and back end when they get to a size where they really just cannot hire any more full stack engineers. So if you have a propensity to work front and back, my guidance would be to focus on full stack, full stack engineering for as long as you can in your career, that is a role that is in very, very, very high demand. It has been for the last several years, ever since I've been looking uh, and hiring engineers. Uh, I don't anticipate the need for it going away anytime soon. DevOps engineer is right up there with mobile engineers. Uh, so DevOps, as you know, is a new and growing field. And especially with all the security threats that we see today, um, especially with our cultures changing around continuous integration, continuous deployments, DevOps is becoming a very critical function in every single organization um, that you talk to. Some of the skills, uh, JavaScript, Java, Python, all primarily uh, you know, core programming languages that still continue to be very, very popular. I'm kind of surprised that Java is up there, uh, you know, because some, for some of us who are uh, working on interpretive languages like Ruby and PHP, you only hear of Ruby and PHP, but Java is has been uh, a foundational language for a very long time, and it continues to be that foundational language um, even today. Last bit. We've talked a lot. Uh, I've shared a lot of data points with you. Um, before you start your search, there, think of your search as, a, as something that has a beginning, a big middle, and an end. The beginning of your search should be figuring out what you want to do. There are so many jobs in the industry today. There is no dearth of jobs. Be mindful and cognizant of what you want to do. What is going to bring, make you bring your passionate self to your next job? And how does this job, how does this next move impact my career and move my career in a positive direction? Once you've established that career timeline, align your resume with that, with what you want to do with your career. When you apply for a particular job, make sure that you cater, to, to, you cater your resume to that job description. Focus on highlighting your key skills and your key powers. Each one of us have, has a secret power. Highlight that secret power uh, because that's what you want to communicate. You do not want to make the hiring managers and the recruiters guess on your behalf. And do your research. There are data resources such as State of Salaries Report at your disposal. We also offer a salary calculator. Uh, I know that these ranges are very, very broad in the report. Look at the salary calculator based on your skills, your years of experience, your location. How much should be you should you be making in uh, uh, in your next move? Uh, so make sure that you've done your research in terms of the skills uh, that you need to acquire to progress in your career. Um, there are great programs like Udacity available for you to refresh your skills. So make sure that you do that before you start your uh, uh, before you start your search. Uh, I want to thank uh, Udacity for hosting this webinar for us. I hope that you found this content um, useful. 
and uh, we uh, will switch to Q and A. Thank you, Needy. This has been really helpful and wonderful. Great to get the insights. Um, I know you touched a little bit about the recruiter versus the actual hiring manager, but we had some questions on um, resume screeners and how to format your resume to get past those automated screeners. Do you have any insights that you can share on that front? Oh, wow. What a great question. Absolutely. So resume screeners are typically looking for structured data on your resume. So a skills section for example, is very important. They're also looking for keywords. So make sure you use the right keywords, you structure your resume so it's easy for a machine to process and read. You're all, uh, you're, most of you uh, are familiar with technology today. Technology is everywhere, you can't escape from it. So imagine if a machine was processing a piece of paper, uh, it's looking for certain keywords. So whatever those keywords are, highlight those keywords. The thing I do not like in resumes is some keywords that are highlighted with a yellow background. That just makes the resume very, very noisy. So I would not encourage you to do that. I would just say, let the machine do its job and let the reader do their job. Awesome. We had a few questions related to the resume screener that um, also touched on dates and including when they ask you to give dates for things and um, around ageism and whether or not how you can get past that either in your resume or in the screening process. Any tips for our um, more experienced viewers? Yeah. So I fall in the same bucket, 20 plus years of experience in the tech industry, right? Uh, my stance on that is I want to highlight my experience. And if the company doesn't care about my experience, then I don't want that job. Uh, so I would not shy away from experience. And guess what? It's actually very, very, very hard to find tech talent that has a lot of years of experience. So highlight that in your resume. Ageism is prevalent in our industry. It will creep in. But I would say you don't want to be in an organization that screens for ageism and, and that doesn't want you. So good riddance. Um, so don't shy away from putting dates on your resume. Put them, if you have experience, highlight that. Use that as a, that's your proficiency, that's your secret power that you've built over the course of you know um, the years that you spent in the industry. So absolutely use that to your advantage. Own it, I like that. So um, you talked about, about experience in making sure that you don't put everything on your resume. But if you are experienced and you have a lot of relevant experience, is it okay ever to go beyond the one-page resume? And what are some guidelines for choosing that? I know a lot of people recommend you keep it to one resume, uh, one page, which we at Udacity do as well. But if you could give us some guidelines on when it's okay to go past the one page and when not to do that. A uh, great question. I went past the one page, I think, when I when I was past like 10 years in my experience. Uh, and, you know, age should not, number of years should not be, uh, you know, a guide, but I sort of wanted to give you that mental frame of mind. Um, my resume, you, you, I think what you want to make sure is you're highlighting the right skill. So, and it's okay to skip. Uh, my point of view is a resume should not be your biography. It should not contain every single thing that you've done. Uh, it should really highlight some really impactful positions or things that you have done in your career. So in my resume today, I have a one-liner that mentions, or I think I just mentioned my degree, and that's it. I don't have my IC career on my resume at all. I don't even have some, I have some short, short stints in my career. I don't even mention those because, you know, in a short stint, I didn't make as much of an impact as I would have wanted to. I'm not lying. When I talk to the recruiter, I talk to them about the fact that I worked at these other companies and I haven't mentioned them. But for brevity, I'm just highlighting the, the impactful roles that I've had. Awesome. Um, so I think I hear you saying that I should not be including my Fortran and COBOL experience on my resume. <laughs> Jane, I have some Fortran experience as well, so we're cut from the same class. <laughs> um, so if, you, if I'm going to focus on a focused resume that is tied to the skills that I, I matter, what if I have hobbies and interests that are related to those skills? Is it ever okay to include that on a resume? I think so. I think we should bring our whole self to our jobs. Um, but you have to be comfortable with it. So, you know, I'm an avid gardener. I don't put 
that on my resume just because I don't want to use up the space, right? Um, but if you really want to bring your passion to work and you want to talk about it, go for it. I am a, a, pro a huge proponent of authenticity and a resume is a mechanism for people to get to know you better. So bring that, bring that, bring that to your job. And sometimes some of these things serve as an icebreaker uh, in a conversation. So I would leave that totally up to you. I think sometimes actually articulating your passion project, whether it's gardening or passion about you know women in tech or some social cause that you're working on, that's totally okay. That speaks to me more about your personality than anything else. Awesome. Um, do you have any particular formatting guidelines that you recommend people follow? I know you talked about not using the yellow highlighting to make it readable, but are there any other formatting tips that you have? Yes. Yeah, so one of the biggest no-nos and turn-offs for me when reading a resume is typos, grammatical errors, and formatting errors. This is your advertisement. Imagine you were watching the Super Bowl and you saw an ad. Uh, which had a tagline and had a typo on it right you don't want that you want you so be as thorough as you can be if you don't think that you've proofread it enough or your eyes are tired come back to it use your friends use your spouse have somebody else proofread it for you use a grammar check make sure that it's grammatically correct the biggest turnoff is when you when if if a hiring manager sees mistakes in the resume, you, I I I personally automatically just do not talk to the candidate because if you're so sloppy in your ad, I can't imagine how your code will be. So you want to make sure you code review your your resume. Uh, that's one. Second, bullets are great in terms of conveying um, the point, but if the resume is just full of indentation one level two level three levels down one it takes up too much space and you won't be able to fit this in a one pager and second it just becomes really hard to process uh, a machine's not reading it a human's reading it so mix some paras some very brief paragraphs with some indentation and i think it it, 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 it significantly enhances the readability of the resume wonderful um so i know space on a resume is precious um it's as valuable as Silicon Valley real estate, you want to conserve as much as you can. Do you have any specific tips on what not to include in a resume? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think as I mentioned earlier, if the work history is not relevant anymore for the job that you're applying for, skip it. Um, don't worry about um, you know it being your biography. Um, if you, I typically do not invest a lot of real estate in explaining what the company does. I would use that. I would I would basically just explain that in like a sentence or two at the most, but don't use a precious paragraph to explain what the company does. If they are interested in you, they will do the research and or you will also have the opportunity to talk to them about what you did. Um, you know, some uh, I think for skills, I'm familiar with HTML, but am I going to highlight that as an SVBF technology? No, it's not relevant. Uh, I think as engineers, as individuals, we learn a lot of skills. Uh, highlight the skills that you think are really, really important uh, to convey. Highlight the ones, if I see uh, a bag of keywords in, in a skills field, I'm not convinced uh, that you're really proficient in anything. So focus on the ones that you really want to focus on, um, and that's it. That's a good advice. So when you talked about um, the, the things to take into consideration with formatting, um, I, I think there's a balance between the visual um, beauty of a resume and a readability, and then as well as the screeners. How do you feel about putting tables on your resume? Does that impact the resume screeners in a negative way? Do you view it as a good way to summarize information? I think I, I personally, I mean, I think it's a balancing act. Um, if you think you can leverage a table and still, still keep the resume concise, do it. I will say that I'm still, I've, I haven't seen any resume that has actually used a table and it's, it's still being a one or a two pager. More often than not, tables end up consuming a lot more space uh, than you have. So 
you can easily, if you're using a table for skills proficiency, as an example, uh, to say I'm skilled Ruby three years, HTML five years, JavaScript 10 years, you can just use that in a skills field uh, within Paren, articulate what you're proficient at, or even better, just say proficient in blah. Uh, and then you've just used one line as opposed to a table. Wonderful. Um, so we talked a little bit about having lots of experience. What about having gaps in your employment? So if you took a long extended break to um, pursue another activity, take care of a family, or for any reason you took some time off, how do you recommend dealing with that big gap in experience in a resume? Right. So great question. I have gaps um, in my career as well. I was a caretaker for my brother and my mother. And um, it depends. It depends on how long the gap is and if you want to call that out. Um, I, my recommendation would be if it's a big gap, highlight that. You don't want, you don't want to leave the hiring manager or, or, or the recruiter with questions about your proficiency and about your background. So let's say I took four years off to have a baby. Uh, just put that on your resume and it's a simple one sentence or two with gaps, uh, which says, you know, took five years off to take care of my baby. And that's it. The question just comes off the table and you don't have to worry about it. And you can go into a deeper explanation about your gap uh, when you actually talk with them. Good. I'd like to swing a little bit now to the other side of the spectrum. We get quite a few questions from interns, and they're wondering about an internship resume. Um, some specific questions are, how do you frame that experience when you might be helping out on a project so you're not overstating your contribution, but also reflecting the skills that you, the valuable skills that you learned? Great question. Uh, I think on the internships, the question that the hiring manager has is, what are the courses this person has taken? And in terms of projects, how many people did they work with? Was it a solo project or was it a really large project? So what you want to highlight is what are the courses you've already taken so that I know how much coaching I would have to provide to you during your, your internship. And from an experience standpoint, when you mention the projects, you want you don't want to leave the hiring manager guessing so state how big the team was and what your role was on that team if it's a two person team then you pretty much know that you're an equal participant so you don't have to highlight what you specifically did but if it's a 10 person team typically doesn't happen but let's say if it was a large team you want you especially want to highlight your contributions and I think if you couch that, if you couch the project in terms of its impact, like what is the data that you measured before and after, that's gravy. You don't always have it, but if you have it, that's gravy because that convinces the hiring manager that you have a business mindset. Great advice. Um, so now we talked about the interns, we talked about the experience. Let's look to someone who's either doing a career change or just starting out in a new field. Do you have any specific tips that convince employers to take a chance on someone who might not have actual work experience in a new area? Absolutely. So look, even before a title change, you end up acquiring skills that make you that will make you succeed in the new job that you're looking for. You either acquire those skills via your experience or you acquire those skills via course offerings such as Udacity. So you want to make sure that you convince the person who's reading your resume as to why you will not need a lot of on-the-job training and what you have done that is similar to what you want to be doing in your aspiration. So when I switch to an engineering manager, I talked about my team lead experience, how ha I had done project management, uh, how I had done some people management by virtue of managing really large projects, by uh, working with stakeholders, by working with cross-functional partners. All of that is key to succeeding as an engineering manager, and that convinces me to take a shot, uh, take a give you give you a chance. Same thing if you're transitioning from. Uh, an engineer to a product manager. You want to highlight some of the things that you have learned either via education or skill advance, skill enhancement or via experience in, that you can bring to the table right out the gate. 
Wonderful. It sounds like you're talking also about soft skills, which I think are really important to show. Very few engineers work in a silo alone. So I, what, I'm curious to know what you think a hiring manager, can, how, how to convey to a hiring manager that you have the team building skills and are able to work collabor collaboratively with others and how important that is in considering a candidate. Absolutely. And I think especially as you get senior uh, in your career, it becomes very, very important for you to highlight the impact that you've had on an organization, either from a soft skill standpoint, either via by or via or leadership standpoint, right? So at the end of the day, if you're working cross-functionally with stakeholders, you're communicating your leadership skills. Uh, if you're actually able to articulate the projects that you worked on and the impact that they've had on the business, that gives me a sense as a hiring manager that you're business minded and and that you're data minded and you're going to be data driven in your analysis. So an example of it is if I'm looking at a resume for a growth engineer and the growth engineer talks about a project that they work on, which resulted in page views going up by 100 percent. I know that this great that this growth engineer is data minded and that's exactly the profile that I want at the company. Oh, awesome. Um, so many of our viewers today are either taking or have taken a, a Udacity Nano degree. How do you think they should most effectively position that education on their resume? Should that go into the education field? Should it go in a way that positions the skills that they learn? And um, do you think that uh, it bears explaining to someone who might not be familiar with the Nano degree what that really entails and in the rigor that's involved in um, learning those skills? So my recommendation would be, I, I put this in the program under the progression bucket. I would absolutely put that in education. Uh, I would also put it under skills uh, because you want to make sure that you, you've invested the time. You're passionate about this topic, and that's the reason why you've invested the time. You want to highlight that. And let's say I took a deep learning course tomorrow, and uh, I, I'm aspiring for a job in deep learning. I may even put that in my tagline up top. Uh, you want to make sure that the reader takes away what you want to convey about yourself. I don't think that in today's day and age you need to explain what a nano degree is. I would say put a link um, in the resume if you think that you need to. But just saying that you've taken a deep learning course uh, on Udacity is sufficient, uh, in my opinion. I think you're, what you're trying to convey is a proficiency level, an interest, and an aspiration to work in a certain domain. And absolutely, you should put that in both, both your education as well as skills at the very least. Wonderful. We've had lots of um, requests for examples of like what you consider are excellent resumes. And I'm wondering if you could, I know you can't necessarily show one here, but if you can describe maybe the features of some of the most impactful and impressive resumes that you've seen. So uh, uh, the most impactful resume, again, thinking from the perspective of a hiring manager. Can a hiring manager process this resume in two minutes? And if the resume passes, uh, screens this in two minutes, what are the two or three takeaways I want to leave the hiring manager with? Is something you want to, it should be top of mind for you. So for a, when you're doing a, uh, a design, a, a common design principle, a user design principle is a squint test. So if I squint my eyes, where do my eyes go to on the screen? You want to put your resume through that squint test and see where your eyes go to. Right. So a really what uh, really well written resume that would pass my squint test would be a really pithy uh, object tagline that states who you are, the experience you're highlighting and what you want to work on. So one of the examples I gave earlier is data analyst with one year experience in Python wants to look for data scientist roles. That right there tells me exactly what you want to work on, because I want to make sure that the candidate that I'm bringing in is truly passionate about the job that I have to offer to them. Uh, after that, you want to have a very small two-sentence paragraph about explaining that tagline, followed by skills slash languages in terms of what your secret powers are. That's where you're highlighting your secret power. And then you go into a work history. In, in work history, 
for you do not want uh, you you don't want a work history yeah, every work history to be half page long it's too much it's just too much have one pithy sentence or two maybe two bullets or three bullets underneath it and move on to the next and that's it wonderful those are great tips um, so you know that we teach robotics and machine learning, so we love robots here. However, we've had some questions about whether or not people actually look at resumes anymore or if they're just looked at by bots. So I'm curious to hear from you how important you think the resume is compared to, say, your GitHub profile or your LinkedIn profile and who tends to look at the resume and how important it still is and relevant in today's job market. Yeah, great question. I would love to be in a world where resumes are not important, but uh, you know, people still look at resumes. So I think, it, but it's, but I think it's changing. It's up to you. If you think that your LinkedIn profile has everything that you want to highlight, then point people to your LinkedIn profile. If resume resumes typically are private compared to LinkedIn profiles, so ten, like, candidates tend to disclose more of themselves, uh, more about themselves in their resume. Uh, but you want some amount of detail, whether you know the, the medium through which you communicate that, whether that's a LinkedIn profile or a resume, is totally up to you. On Hired, our profiles are public, so when you create a profile on Hired, you're able to put content there. That is not going to be publicly seen, so that's up to you as well. Hiring managers do look at resumes. On Hired, we see a mix. We see a mix of hiring managers looking at resumes versus not, but that's primarily because our profiles are very, very rich. Uh, so our profiles are equivalent of a resume. Um, a manager, uh, if a recruiter is the gate, uh, who is the person who opens the gate, the manager is the next level, is the next gate. After the manager has developed some confidence and you've spent two minutes processing your resume, then they may pass it on to their lead engineer or they may personally go to your GitHub and look at your profile because they want to understand if the ad matches the person behind the ad and the work product of this person. So that's what your GitHub profile is for. So you make sure. So I think all three are important, but they play very, very different roles. Machines are processing resumes. But machines cannot do, a, you know, there's, we, have, we have ways to go from an AI standpoint. So even at Hired, we leverage AI to process resumes and to put candidates, candidate profiles in front of, uh, you know, our hiring managers. But we know that we, uh, you know, technology is imperfect. And that's one of the reasons why Hired as a platform has made a conscious choice to ensure that our candidates are coupled with a talent advocate. Uh, so technology cannot do it all. Uh, we are imperfect. Uh, we as humans, when we're creating a resume, are imperfect, and hiring managers are imperfect. I may look at one resume, I may, I may nix it for some reason, but I may accept the other one for the same reason. So uh, don't assume that only machines are looking at them. It's both. People still hire people, right? Yep, exactly, exactly. And, and and you know, at the end of the day, recruiting is about connecting two imperfect beings uh, on both sides. So yeah, it, it, it's a long time before machines can solve it all. You mentioned that you moved from an engineering role into a management role. And we had a few questions about looking at what that career timeline looks like. Can you give an example of, you mentioned career progression and showing progression of what a career timeline might look like from someone who's staying in the technical field and then someone who might be moving from technical to either project man, product management or into um, um, engineering management as well? Right. I think it really is very individual and circumstance driven. <clears throat> so there's no hard and fast rules around, you know, oh my God, I've been, in, I've been in this role for five years. You know, I should be like, there should be a career change for me or a title change for me or what have you. Like I said, progression can be so many different things to so many different people. It could just be, I am growing as an engineer. I love being an engineer. I love coding day and night. I am just progressing by virtue of learning new skills, right? So I think oftentimes, especially in engineering, we think that we're stagnating if we don't see a title change. That's not the case at all. Uh, there are many ways you can show progression and that you can progress in your career. For me personally, the opportunity to become a lead came early. 
So I was an IC for uh, five years, and then I got promoted to a manager. Typical, my recommendation, if I had to do it all over again, I would not become a manager five years into my career. It was too early. I was not prepared for it. I had not, uh, I had not developed the competence for it, uh, to be very honest. The guidance I give my engineers now is take the title change when you're really ready for it, when you're prepared for it, because then the likelihood of you succeeding is going to be way higher than a sink or swim, swim situation. So my guidance is prepare for your next move, be ready for it, and then go get it. That's great advice. That's wonderful advice. Um, so along the lines of someone just starting out or someone from a non-traditional background, do you have any specific tips on how to get noticed if, say, you don't come from an Ivy League university or if you don't have a lot of experience or your experiences is nothing completely unrelated? Um, if you were, uh, you know, worked in, an, in, a, in a manual, uh, like in, in a bartender or if you had a, at a job that was completely unrelated and you are now breaking into tech, you've got the skills, but you don't have the experience. Yeah, great question. I see those candidates all the time. I myself, you know, um, uh, I'm very similar. I, do, I wasn't educated to be an, an, an engineering manager. I have a, I have a double E degree. I don't have a CS degree. Uh, so I think you will come across these obstacles through the course of your career. Yes, a transition from a bartender to tech is, is steep. No denying that at all. Um, I think, again, focus on why you are ready for this role. That's what you want to convince the hiring team of. That's what you want to convince the recruiter of. So if you are switching careers from a bartender to, uh, to an engineer, then highlight the skills that you have learned. If you've taken a course at App Academy or if you've taken multiple courses at Udacity, highlight those skills. Talk about some of the projects that you worked on. And I know that not all of us have time copious free time to work on lots of personal passion projects. Talk about the projects that you worked on at your during your courses and highlight what you're proficient in. And a hiring manager may be more familiar with candidates coming from a CS degree. So if you've taken a course in data algorithms or in object-oriented programming, highlight that so that for the hiring manager, you're creating an equivalence between the course that you've taken and the CS degree candidates that the hiring manager is, is going through to articulate where your strengths are and how you're equivalent from a, uh, from a coursework standpoint. Oh, that's great advice. So we're almost at the end of time. We have lots more questions, but unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap it up. So as a last question, I'd like to take us at the end back to the beginning. And I would like to say, I am just starting out looking for a new job. Where do you recommend I start? Great question. Uh, so I started using Hired before I joined Hired. I will say there is no platform such as Hired. Uh, and the reason why is because Hired is the only platform where candidate is in full control. You as a candidate come create your profile. You wait for jobs to come to you. You as a candidate create your profile. And at the very beginning, state how much you deserve. Uh, there is no. All of us hate negotiate negotiation. We just take the pain out of negotiation right out the gate. So that especially if you're a tech worker, especially if you're in the technology industry, try hired, you will be pleased. We set expectations right out the gate. If you don't, if we don't have jobs for you, we will not fool you. If we have jobs for you, try your luck and what do you have to lose? That's great advice. Thank you, Nidhi. And thank you so much for all the wonderful insights you shared today. They're really helpful, and I appreciate how actionable they are. You, you gave insights for the broad spectrum of our audience, and I think everyone walked away with something they can use. Um, I want to remind everyone, as a special takeaway, that Nidhi also shared the detailed salary report that she mentioned. Look in the chat for a link to that really valuable resource. And um, I'd also like to remind you that Udacity offers free career courses as well. So look for a link in the chat to the um, free career courses, including some a, a course on writing your resume that we would like to share with you there as well. Um, thank you, Needy. Thank you, Hired, for joining us today. And I appreciate everyone's time. Stay curious and keep learning. Thank you, Jane. Thanks so much for your time, everybody, for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.